Bhagavate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Eti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavani Pascharya Deshatarine Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So I thought it would be nice to go through the pastimes of Dhruva Maharaj again while I'm here in Singapore. I hope it will be refreshing for you. So the third canto ended with Kapila Shiksha and we heard about Devahuti and her husband Kardama and how Kardama had gone away and left Devahuti with her divine son, Lord Kapila. So the fourth canto continues to hear more about the descendants of Swayambhu Vamanu. Swayambhu Vamanu had two sons, Uttanapada and Priyavrata. Priyavrata is described in the fifth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. But Uttanapad, he, the, he was the father of Dhruva Maharaj. So Uttanapad is described as having two wives. Probably had more than two wives. <laughs> I was reading uh, Valmiki Ramayan and it was describing about Maharaj Dasara usually we hear that Maharaj Dasarath had three wives, Goshalya, Sumitra, and Kaikeya. But it's also said he had 350 other wives. So <laughs> that was in Valmiki Ramayana. So I take it as being authoritative. Anyway, uh, Lord Krishna had 16,108 wives. So we're told Uttanapada has two wives, two principal wives, just like Lord Krishna had his principal wives, eight wives, and Maharaj Dasara had three principal wives. So the subject matter Uttanapada is describing about the dealings of these two ladies, Suniti and Suruchi. So they're both wives of Uttanapad, and they both have sons. Suruchi, her son is called Uttama, and Suniti's son is Dhruva. So Uttanapada Maharaj has great, uh, greater affection for Suruchi than he has for Suniti. Just like in Ramayana, we see how Kaike had so much, that Maharaj Dasara had so much affection for Kaike, it brought him a lot of problems. So Uttanapada has affection for Suruchi, and it's known to Suruchi that she is a favorite wife of her husband. And Srila Prabhupada comments that 
even on a very elevated level of society, such as the dynasty of Swambhuva Manu, that there is also female nature, nature of a woman, and it is displayed there in the dealings between these different ladies, Suniti and Suruchi. So Srimad Bhagavatam describes to us how while Uttanapada is sitting with his wife Suruchi, at that time Dhruva comes in and he desires to sit on to get up onto the throne where his father is and if possible to even sit on the lap of his father. But when Dhruva Maharaj made the attempt to get up onto his father's lap, at that time he was rebuked by Suruchi. And he was rebuked with some harsh words. Suruchi said to him that you have no right to sit there. You cannot sit there. You cannot sit up there on your father's lap. That is not for you. You are not born from my womb. If you want to sit there on the lap of your father, what you should do is you will have to worship the Supreme Lord. You will have to practice austerity worship the Supreme Lord and get his mercy and with his mercy you may be able to take birth from my womb. Once you take birth from my womb then you might be qualified to sit on the lap of your father. Not before. So these were very harsh words to say to a young child. Sometimes, you know, children can be very sensitive and they remember these kind of incidents. So, Dhruva Maharaj, being born in the royal family of Swayambhuva Manu, he has the Kshatriya nature. Swayambhuva Manu was the father of Uttanapada, and Uttanapada is the father of Dhruva. So the Kshatriya spirit is there. And Dhruva Maharaj is affected by these words. So what does he do? He goes to his mother. He goes to find Suniti. That's natural. Children are in distress. They will look for their parent who can give them shelter. So Dhruva Maharaj came to, in search of his mother. And when he found his mother, his mother told him that Suruchi was right. What she said to you is true. Suniti described her plight. She said, your father does not even consider me to be his wife. He does not even consider me to be his maidservant. The poor lady is in a very unfortunate position. Right? She's the father. She's the mother of a uh, Uttanapada's child, but she is much neglected due to the fault of Uttanapada that he has become controlled by the other woman, Suruchi. He's become like what we would say a dancing dog in the hands of his fair wife. So Suniti explains to Dhruva Maharaj that what you need to do is 
you need to take shelter of the Supreme Lord. He is the only one who can help you. And Suniti backs up what she says with examples. She said, just like Lord Brahma. Lord Brahma is the great grandfather of Dhruva Maharaj. He is the father of Swayambhuvamanu. Brahma had many sons. One of them was Swayambhuvamanu. So Suniti cites the example of Lord Brahma that Lord Brahma, at the beginning of the creation, he performed great austerity and he pleased the Supreme Lord. By the mercy of the Lord, he was able to do the work of creation. And then she gives another example. She said, what to speak of Lord Brahma, Swayambhuvamanu, your grandfather, he also got the mercy of the Lord by performing sacrifices and giving charity. He got the mercy of the Lord. And by the mercy of the Lord, Swayambhuvamanu was able to enjoy wonderful opulence in this world. And at the end of his life, at the end of his life, he went on to enjoy liberation. He was liberated from material existence, all by the mercy of the Lord. So in this way, she's inspiring Dhruva Maharaj that, you know, you want to get something, you want to, you have some desire, you want to get something, you should approach the Supreme Lord. Don't approach any other personality. Don't go to any, anyone lesser than the Supreme Lord. In other words, the demigods are not going to help you. Although many people do worship the goddess of fortune, just like Dhruva Maharaj has the desire, you know, he's been insulted, he's been told, you're not qualified to sit on the throne, you cannot be up there, you're not going to be the king, you're not born from my womb. So Dhruva Maharaj desires to get revenge. It's not pure devotion, right? But he's, he's, he's been hurt, and he's a small child. So he wants to get revenge. And how to get revenge? He thinks, I will get a kingdom greater than my father, greater than my grandfather, and even greater than my great-grandfather. He wants to get a kingdom greater than anything anyone ever had before. This is Dhruva Maharaj's desire. So Suniti tells her son that you have to worship the Supreme Lord. No one else can fulfill your desire. Don't approach any other person. So hearing these words from his mother, Dhruva Maharaj then resolves, he has to find the Lord. So he, he asks his mother, where will I find him? So his mother said, well, great sages, they often go to the forest when they're looking for the Lord. So Dhruva Maharaj also decides, all okay, right, I will go to forest. And in this way, Dhruva Maharaj entered into the forest. <laughs> Another Dhruva, huh? An upcoming Dhruva. He's not old enough, not five yet. You have to wait till you're five, Prabhu. 
So Dhruva Maharaj resolves to go to the forest. But before he can even get to the forest, Narada Muni comes. Now, how did Narada Muni know to come? How does he know what's going on? He wasn't present in the palace. How did he know? So Srila Prabhupada explains to us that Narada Muni is Trikala Gya. He knows all phases of time. He knows the past, he knows present, and he, can, he knows what's going to happen in the future. So he appears. Sometimes we will also, uh, it happened with Srila, Srila Prabhupada one time, he wrote a letter to the devotees in Los Angeles temple and he told them, make sure you keep the pujari room neat and clean. So the devotees, uh, the temple president in Los Angeles, he got the mail and so he looked, he went to see the pujari room to see what was going on. And when he went in the Pujari room, he was quite shocked to see it was a real mess. You know, things were all over the place and nothing was really taken care of. So he wondered, how did Prabhupada know that this Pujari room was a, such a mess that he wrote in the letter and told us that we have to keep the Pujari room neat and clean? Prabhupada was on the other side of the world. How did he know about the Pujari room? And he asked Prabhupada, Prabhupada, are, are you the super soul? Is it because you're the super soul in everyone's heart, so you knew? And Prabhupada said, no, he said, I'm not the super soul, but sometimes Krishna tells me things. So like that, the, the spiritual master, sometimes he knows things that Krishna reveals to him. And in this way, the devotees could do certain things. We should understand that sometimes we do say the spiritual teacher is the external manifestation of the super soul. So he's one and different from the super soul. We can understand the spiritual master is not Krishna, but he's representative of Krishna. So Narada Muni was guided by the Lord in his heart, and he came there to meet Dhruva Maharaj. We often see these kind of events taking place, just like the speaking of Srimad Bhagavatam. You know, nowadays we have groups, and you have group chats and everything, and you have WhatsApp and everything, so we can get information what's going on. But 5,000 years ago, there was no WhatsApp. And, and how did people know to come to Naimisharanya, for example, to hear Sriman Bhagavatam, or to come and hear Maharaj Parikshit being instructed by Sukadeva Goswami? This just simply came. The Lord in the heart directs the devotees how to proceed where to go, what to do. They're guided by the Lord in the heart. Just like Srila Prabhupada was guided to go to America. Although his Guru Maharaj had sent people to, the, to England, Prabhupada went to the USA. He was guided in the heart. Now if he'd gone to England, probably it mean, the result would not have been the same. But because he went to USA, Krishna had that plan. Krishna guided him and arranges for these things to take place. So similarly, Narada Muni appeared in front of Dhruva Maharaj and he's, and he's asking Dhruva Maharaj that, well, he's telling Dhruva Maharaj, you know, it, it's very nice that you're so bold, you want to go into the forest, although you're just a young child. We have to understand that in the times of Dhruva, 
going into the forest was very dangerous. Just as in Treta Yuga, when Lord Ramachandra was going into the forest, it was certainly very dangerous. And they, the, the, the Maharaj Dhataras considered that how will he ever come back? That if my son goes there into the forest, how will he ever survive? And there are many wild animals, not only wild animals, there's many rakshasas, and so many dangers there. So Dhruva Maharaj, as a young child, to go into the forest was certainly very dangerous. And, and we actually hear later on in Srimad Bhagavatam that while Dhruva's in the forest, Maharaj Uttanapada is lamenting. He's, he's broken hearted because he feels that because his son has gone to the forest, he must have died. He must have been killed in the forest. He will never survive a young child going into the forest. But Dhruva Maharaj is not thinking that this is a challenge. He's not thinking this is very difficult. Young children often do things without thinking too much about it. You know, they're very bold. <laughs> they often do things and you may tell them, oh no, no, don't do that. Anyway, Narada Muni wants to tell Dhruva Maharaj, you know, what you're trying to do is very noble, but, you know, you, you're too young. You have to wait till you're a bit mature. And generally, we do see that the path of spiritual life comes later in life for most people. The ashrams that are arranged like that, maybe in the beginning brahmacharya life, student life, studying, getting knowledge, and then grihastha life, entering into family life, and having a family, living in the world, maybe working also, doing things like that, getting more experience, and then later on, retirement. The Vedas say, from the age of 50, you should think about retirement. It's recommended. Why 50? Well, half the life is over. You have to prepare. It takes time to detach ourselves from the material world. And we have to give ourselves time. So it's recommended that about the age of 50, that's an appropriate time to retire. Of course, some people take early retirement, and some people, they're a little later. But it's recommended that stop the material duties and concentrate more on the spiritual side of life. So it usually comes later in the life. That is the system. Srila Prabhupada certainly followed that. He changed his ashram, each ashram, with the greatest reluctance. He was, his father had him married. He wasn't eager to get married. He even told his father, I don't like that girl very much. And his father said, good. <laughs> he said, that's an advantage. If you like her too much, that would be a problem. So anyway, he married, and he, they probably had five children. And then later on, he was, he was doing his business for some time, but Krishna arranged that the business ended. Prabhupada told us, he said he was thinking he would make money and give it to his spiritual master. But Krishna had other plans. Krishna took away the business, and Prabhupada didn't have so much money anymore. And the family were no longer very respectful to him, and he saw it was a good time to get out from the family life. And so he entered into the retirement, and he was living in Vrindavan. 
And again and again, his spiritual master was coming to him in dreams and telling him that you have to take sannyas. So after repeated, uh, after the, having these dreams repeatedly, then he approached one of his god brothers, Keshava Prabhna Maharaj in Mayapur, well in Mathura actually, and they took, he took sannyas. So Prabhupada took his sannyas, but with great reluctance. Not that he was so eager to make the changes, but he understood it was necessary. It's a part of life that we should follow the Vedic culture. And that part of the Vedic culture involves retirement, and with retirement, more dedication to spiritual practice. It is necessary as we prepare for the next life. So Narada Muni was telling Dhruva Maharaj, you know, you're just a young boy, you know, you can't do this at this point. What you want to do, you want to practice this mystic yoga, you know, it takes these yogis lifetimes to achieve perfection in their yoga practice. And you want to begin at this a tender age? Young children, usually their interest is in sports and games. You know, they, they have, that's how most of us spend our childhood, right? Where's the cricket ball and the football and this ball, that on some kind of game. And now it's mobile games, you know, yeah. They have the games on the mobile phone and these kind of things occupy people, children. They don't think much usually about any other goal. But Dhruva Maharaj is an exception. He has been hurt. He's been hurt. The, the insult had gone deep into his heart and it was too painful for him. He wanted to do something, to get some revenge for himself. So in this way, he has gone off, or he wants to go into the forest. But Narada Muni is not encouraging him. Now, Narada Muni, he's of course brahmachari. He never married. He doesn't know about the politics and the intrigue which go on in family life. Right? He was spared from all of that by uh, the, at the early death of, well, when he was the son of a maidservant, mother died, then later on he was the son of Brahma. There was no mother, <laughs> right? He just came the son of Brahma, manifest from the body of Brahma. There's no mention of a wife. And so Narada Muni is not aware of all these things. But he is also a spiritual teacher. And as a spiritual teacher, it's his duty to test the sincerity of the disciple. Srila Prabhupada remarks, he said that the path of devotional service is both easy and difficult. It's easy for people who are very determined and sincere, and it's very difficult for people who are not determined and not sincere. <laughs> so it, it's based on these two qualities, sincerity of purpose and that determination. In Bhagavad Gita, Prabhupada gives that example about determination, about the little sparrow who lost his eggs to the sea and how the little sparrow wanted to drink the ocean dry. Of course, the little sparrow, how can he drink the ocean? But he was so determined, he was trying to drink the ocean. And somehow news came to Garuda. So then Garuda, the king of birds, came there and he spoke to the ocean and said, you give the 
this bird this egg back or else I will drink you dry. And so the ocean honored the words of Garuda and returned the eggs to the sparrow. So that kind of determination, uh, determination, one of the important qualities mentioned also in Rupadeshamrita by Srila Rupa Goswami for making advancement in devotional service. He mentions Utsahan, Nishchaya Dayat, right? First of all, enthusiasm, patience, and determination. And Srila Prabhupada remarks that in every endeavor, you need these kind of qualities. Whatever you're going to do, you want to be a, a mother, bring up a child, you have to have enthusiasm, patience, and, and determination. Not very easy, difficult. You're going to work in a job, find a job and work, takes patience, enthusiasm, determination. So in devotional service, these things are also very important, these three qualities. So having that patience, just like Srila Prabhupada had to have a lot of patience in establishing the Krishna consciousness movement. He was patiently trying to preach. He began the Back to Godhead in 1944. And then he went to America, it was 1966. He spent 22 years. At, there hadn't really, he hadn't achieved hardly anything. I think he had one disciple, one initiated person. He made attempts, but somehow nothing had fructified. But Prabhupada didn't give up. He, he was patient. He kept trying. And then when he went to America, New, New York, first of all, he was uptown and he was with Dr. Mishra, uh, meeting Dr. Mishra's yoga students. And, you know, they were interested, but Dr. Mishra wasn't giving him any space. Dr. Mishra didn't want to lose his students. He was keeping his students under his, own, under his shelter. And so then Srila Prabhupada moved to the Lower East Side to New York. And in New York, the Lower East Side, where all the young hippies and the Mets monsters and these people were. And so Prabhupada was living in that kind of environment and he began his preaching there. And different people came. Some were crazy people. Some were really mad. And Prabhupada had to tolerate, he had to be very patient to continue to try to establish this Krishna consciousness movement. So here we see Narada Muni talking to Dhruva Maharaj. She's telling Dhruva Maharaj, you know, that what you want to do is very good, but you know, you're not you're not really ready for it yet. You're just still a child. How can you ever think to do it at this point in your life? Better you go home and come back later in your life. And then it will be good. But Dhruva Maharaj has the Kshatriya spirit. Oh, you have to understand Narada Muni's purpose. That Narada Muni while he's a brahmachari and also a spiritual teacher, his duty as a spiritual teacher is to test the prospective candidate for initiation. Narada Muni is a spiritual teacher. Now he's, he can give initiation, he can instruct Dhruva Maharaj in the, what he needs to do. But he wants to make sure that Dhruva Maharaj is really serious and really determined. 
So this is why Narada Muni is speaking in this manner. It's a test. And Prabhupada writes, he said, it's the duty of the spiritual master to test the disciple before initiation. And Srila Prabhupada also would test the disciples. He would test, you know, first of all, do things like shave your head. You know, that was a test, you know. Are you serious? Okay, shave your head, you know, and put on the devotee dress, and then also, you know, go out on Sankirtan. Do what service are you doing? You know, you should, everyone should join the Sankirtan movement. And we would go out on Sankirtan. Like that. So, Prabhupada would test us. And then, it's not just one time. Not that you just go out one day, you know, but you, you'd go out regularly. You'd become committed to the Sankirtan movement. Prabhupada wanted to see that we were really fixed in devotional service. And even then, when we came in front of Prabhupada to get initiation, he would ask us, he would say, what is my pranam mantra? <laughs> because sometimes, you know, you, you get devotees, they want initiation. They don't even know the name of the spiritual master. <laughs> what to speak of the pranam mantra. And so Prabhupada was testing the devotees, you know, that you want to get initiation, you have to be qualified. You have to show that you're sincere and you're determined. And so, like that, nowadays we try to test the devotees also. We do continue, continue to test the devotees, like before initiation, everyone should take part in the ISKCON disciple course. They should attend the disciple course and learn everything about ISKCON and also how to select the spiritual teacher and what is the qualification and what is the qualification for the disciple. All of these different things, they should be learned. And before someone enters or becomes initiated in Krishna consciousness, they should know these basic things. So we see even five, even millions of years ago, in the time of Dhruva Maharaj, Narada Muni was testing Dhruva Maharaj. Are you sincere? Are you really genuine? Are you really determined you're going to do this? So Narada Muni is telling him, you know, hey, go back, you can come back later, you know. Sometimes, you know, you have people, they, they think, they, you ask them, are you following the four principles? Yeah, mostly I'm following the four principles. <laughs> are you chanting 16 rounds every day? Yeah, mo most days I chant 16 rounds. <laughs> you know, not very, uh, not fully. 100%. Anyway, this is a, an important part in uh, accepting a spiritual master. Just that, as we say, the disciple should test the spiritual teacher, and the spiritual teacher will also test the disciple. Disciple should test the spiritual teacher. How? Well, you want to see, first of all, that the spiritual teacher is qualified, that he can help you in your spiritual path, that he can answer your questions, that he can guide you properly. You want, he should know the philosophy. You want to see also that the spiritual teacher is practicing himself. He's not just telling you to chant, but he also chants himself. And he's not just telling you to wake up early in the morning, but he also wakes up early in the morning. You know, so in other words, he teaches by his example. So before we accept initiation, it's important. There should be this testing on both sides. You want to make sure that the spiritual teacher meets you, what you're looking for in a spiritual teacher. 
different people look for different things. It's every individual's own choice, therefore. But we see in the case of Dhruva Maharaj, how, how he got the guru. How did he get the guru? By the grace of Krishna. In the Chaitanya Charitamrita, it is described, Brahmanda Brahmite Konya Bhagavan Jeev Guru Krishna Prasadi Pai Bhakti Lata Beach, right? We're traveling in many different universe Brahmanandas through different places in different species of life and somehow we've become fortunate that we've come to this human form of life and we contact the spiritual teacher who gives us the seed of bhakti, that seed of devotion. That is good fortune. We become fortunate. Suniti was saying, I'm unfortunate. She said, I'm unfortunate. I'm, you know, your father, he doesn't even consider me to be his wife. He doesn't even consider to be a maidservant. I'm unfortunate. And she told Dhruva Maharaj, you're unfortunate too because you're born from my womb. So that was on a material basis. But now we see Dhruva Maharaj has become fortunate. And his good fortune is that he has contacted Narada Muni. That is a sign of good fortune, to contact the spiritual master. Many years ago, we used to have a, a newsletter called the the Bhakta newsletter that was brought up by Danavir Goswami. And later on, Danavir Goswami wrote a book about it called The Fortunate Souls. And he describes about how people become devotees, how they come to Krishna consciousness. All fortunate souls, they come into contact with the devotees and they learn devotional service. So similarly, here you have Dhruva Maharaj contacting Narada Muni. And Narada Muni, after testing him, and he sees how Dhruva Maharaj responds. And Dhruva Maharaj tells Narada Muni, he said, he said, no, and he said, I'm sorry, I can't accept your instructions. He said, by nature, I'm impudent. <laughs> By nature, I, I don't, uh, I'm, not, I'm not a very obedient child, but uh, he said, I'm, I'm, I have to get my revenge, I've got my plans, I know what I want to do, and I'm, I'm, I want to go ahead with it. My plan is to go into the forest there and to search out the Supreme Lord. And if you can help me, then I'll be very happy to hear from you. Actually, before this happened, before Dhruva Maharaj replied to Narada Muni, Narada Muni had been telling Dhruva Maharaj, you know, you should just be satisfied. You know, don't be so anxious to get a big kingdom. Just be satisfied. And Narada Muni explains, you know, Happiness and distress, they will come. And just see it all as the grace of the Lord. Those who are in knowledge, they will see the happiness in life. It's the arrangement of the Lord. And the distress is also the Lord's arrangement. It's for our purification. When we're happy, we're, it means we're using up our good karma. And when we're in distress, we're using up our bad karma. And so, just be satisfied. Don't worry about things. And Narada Muni advises Dhruva Maharaj how to deal with different people, how to relate to different people. He said, for people who are more advanced than you, don't be envious of them. Be happy to meet people who are greater than you. And for people who are equal to you, 
Don't try to put yourself greater than them. Just make friends with them. Have a friendly relationship with them. Don't try to put people down and put yourself up. Just make a friend, friendly relationship. And when someone is below you, and someone is uh, uh, inferior to you, don't deride them and don't knock them, ridicule them, but be compassionate to them and kind to them and caring. This particular verse, which comes in the, in the, the eighth chapter of uh, this fourth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, is quoted by Bhakti Charuswami in his book on Vaishnava etiquette. And he said, this is how we should relate to other people. People who are greater than us, be joyful, be happy to be with them. And people who are, uh, are equals, have a friendly relationship, make friends. Some people, they can only make enemies. <laughs> Srila Prabhupada told one devotee, the one devotee, he was quite a senior man, he said, you simply make enemies everywhere. Uh, so making friends, actually that's the art of preaching, somehow to, to make friends with people, because to bring people into Krishna consciousness, you have to have a friendly atmosphere. You have to be, you have, you have to be caring and kind, and then it opens the doors for people to come forward and take part in Krishna consciousness. And when people are lower, don't be ridiculing them and deriding them, but be compassionate and caring and help them to come up. So, as leaders in Krishna consciousness, actually, they have that responsibility to bring others up in Krishna consciousness. In other words, to give them more responsibility, give them more opportunity for service. This is how people can come forward in Krishna consciousness. We are always looking for volunteers. We need volunteers in Krishna, right? And uh, if people will come forward and volunteer to take up some service, it's for their benefit, as well as for the benefit of the Krishna Consciousness Movement. There's so much to be done. So many services are needed. We are always on the lookout for volunteers. Now, more and more people are coming to the center here. It's an opportunity for more and more service. Because there's more people to take care of. It's bigger, bigger responsibilities, greater responsibilities. And so, if we accept that responsibility, we make advancement in Krishna consciousness. But if we run away, we shy away from taking some responsibility, then we will never really progress. So we, we encourage all of you, take up more service on behalf of Krishna. So Dhruva Maharaj was really tested by Narada Muni. Narada Muni did all he could to discourage him. But Dhruva Maharaj is fixed that he said, no, I, I can't follow your instruction. If you're going to help me, then tell me what I can do. Give me some instructions. Sometimes it does happen that we give people instructions, but uh, they don't follow them carefully. We get instructions. Spiritual teachers can I telling us do this. And if we don't take the instruction to heart, then we don't get any benefit. So that it's a disappointment to the, the spiritual teacher. So 
So we want to try to take the instruction seriously, to try to follow. Uh, even the little details, even the small instructions are important. Sometimes devotees are happy just to follow four principles and chant 16 rounds. That's the minimum. But there are many other things which we're supposed to do, different activities which we're supposed to perform in the practice of devotional service. We need to do these things. We need to, we want to follow all of the details, all of the instructions, even the small ones. So the more we hear about Srila Prabhupada and his teachings, the more we can understand how to practice devotional service. So Narada Muni is getting instruction, he's giving instruction to Dhruva Maharaj what he needs to do. He's going to tell him that first thing is you have to apply your mind to the Supreme Lord. And then he's also going to tell him there's a certain place you should go. He's going to send him to a place called Madhuvan, which is in the forest of Vrindavan. Srila Prabhupada remarks about entering the forest, just like we said, one of the stages of uh, spiritual life is Vana Prasta, meaning you should go to the forest. So Prabhupada explains going to the forest, he said for the Gaudiya Vaishnavas, that means go to the forest of Vrindavan. Go to Praja. The forests are there, 12 forests are there in Vrindavan. And he said, going to the forest of Vrindavan means to take shelter of Vrindavan Ishwari. Vrindavan Ishwari is Srimati Radharani. She is the proprietor of Vrindavan. So you enter the forest of Vrindavan, take shelter of Srimati Radharani and she can deliver the soul from material life. So Narada Muni instructs Dhruva Maharaj that you go to Madhuvan and there on the bank of the Bindusa, on the bank of the lake there, Bindusa you can bathe there three times a day. It said, brahmacharis bathe once a day, grihastas bathe twice a day, sannyasis bathe three times a day. Lord Chaitanya would go three times a day to the sea. When he was staying in Jagannath Puri, he would go three times a day and take bath in the sea. Quite an austerity, because sea is very salty water. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, every day, very regularly, he would always go to take his bath in the sea. And so, Dhruva Maharaj was also told, taking bath three times a day. It's very purifying if you try that. Some, some, some places people don't take bath at all. <laughs> but uh, it's an important part of spiritual life, just bathing regularly. If you have to live in very cold countries, you know, there are people in Russia, you live in Russia, some part, people in Russia, not everyone has running water. They often they have to get water, they store the water, you melt the ice to get some water. Mm -hmm. So quite difficult circumstances. How to take bath? Well, one way, one way you can do it is by chanting the holy name. You can take bath in the holy name. But that's not an excuse, you know. That <laughs> Just, we're, if the opportunity is there, we should be regular. So Dhruva Maharaj got this instruction from Narada Muni, you go there and you take bath regularly.
three times a day. Just like the Goswamis were living in Radhakund, Rupa Rajna Das Goswami, and uh, some of, they were bathing there in Radhakund three times a day. But not only bathing, and, but also remembering the Lord, fixing the mind on the Lord. And in order to do that, Narada Muni instructs Dhruva Maharaj that you make a deity. So deity worship is a very important part in the process of self-realization, that you worship a deity. So you see also in Katyayani Vrat, the gopis were performing Katyayani Vrat. Every day they go to the Yamuna to take bath they make a deity of goddess Katyayani every day because they put it, it would be in the water and the Yamuna would come and wash the deity away. So every day they'd make a new deity. And so similarly, Dhruva Maharaj was also told by Narada Muni to make a deity and he was also told to chant a mantra. He was given a mantra. Just like we were, we were also given a mantra at the time of the initiation. The Guru initiates you into the chanting of Hare Krishna mantra. Uh, I was staying in Mayapur for a few years with the lockdown and I had the opportunity to hear different devotees speak about events which happened when they were with Srila Prabhupada. So I was hearing one devotee, and my god brother, he was describing how he was serving Srila Prabhupada, and it happened that he'd lost his initiation beads. And so he came to Prabhupada and he asked Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada, could you chant on my beads for me? And Prabhupada said, I have given you the holy name, that's enough. <laughs> he said, I've given you the holy name. You don't need me to chant on your beats. That was the meaning, you know. And I've given you the holy name. That's the important thing. It's not so much the beats. Although, yeah, we should value the beats that spiritual master gives us, and we should value them. But Prabhupada was making the point that uh, the connection is made there by the, the initiation. At the time of initiation, he gives you the mantra, he gives you the holy name. You're initiated into the chanting. It's not that, oh, I don't have my beads, I can't chant. <laughs> Somebody may think, oh, I lost my beads, I, won't, I, won't, I have to wait till I get new beads or something. And, you know, no, you have to chant, regardless of what you chant on, you have to do the chanting. It's very important. The process is not material. Devotional service doesn't depend on material facilities. We use whatever is available, just like worshipping the deity. Dhruva Maharaj was told, you, you, you worship the deity just according to the means, whatever is available. We, uh, we, we see different parts of the world, different things, dif difficult to get flowers. I was hearing, even here in Singapore, during the lockdown, there were no flowers. Very difficult to get flowers. And, and the devotees were going out and just taking from the trees nearby. The neighbor walked down the street and find a tree with some flowers. And you're lucky you can do that. <laughs> if, you know, in Japan, in Japan, flowers are very expensive. One flower costs so much money. And other parts of the world, there'll be no flowers. Difficult to get flowers. Where was it? Oh, I was in Kuwait. <laughs> Kuwait, did you go to a place like Kuwait? 
It's a desert. There, there's not, there's not flower. It's difficult to get flowers there. Very difficult. So, but that doesn't mean you cannot do deity worship. You have to do the deity worship. Oh. And we had the example of the brahmana who was worshiping the deity in his mind. So within your mind, at least, if you cannot get the flowers, within your mind you can offer everything to the Lord. In this way, devotional service should be performed regardless of our material situation. We have to perform the activity, make use of whatever is available. And if what's not available, then within our mind we have to think of it and offer it to the Lord. All right, so I'll stop here today. We'll continue on this theme tomorrow. Are there any questions today? Thank you so much. How will we understand uh, Subhichi's behavior? Like, even though she revoked uh, Shiva Maharaj, her instruction was kind of partially kind of true, but however, it is like her sense of fear. Will we understand uh, is it instruction or is it like Lord's uh, play that she removed this? Uh, yes, the how do we understand the mood of Tsuruchi? Yes. yes. Well, how do we understand that? that uh, yes, she was insulting to Dhruva, but at the same time, what she had said was true. And she told him, you have to take birth from my womb. Is that actually true? <laughs> How do we understand the mood of Suruchi? We understand that somehow she, she's fortunate, but at the same time she's not fortunate because she couldn't take advantage of the whole situation. She's proud and she was envious of Dhruva. But later on, we do see that when Dhruva Maharaj came back from the forest, she also came with Suniti. The two of them came together to welcome Dhruva Maharaj back when he returns from the forest. So she did get some purification. Because later on, Maharaj Uttanapada greatly lamented that he'd been unjust, he hadn't been caring to his son. And he was lamenting that his son had gone off to the forest, and he thought, for sure, my son must be dead in the forest. And it was Narada Muni who came and enlightened him and said, no, he's not dead, but he's become fully self-realized. The Lord has appeared to him. So Uttanapada was, you know, it was, a, it was a great shock. It was a great surprise to him. Of course, it was wonderful news to him, but it was certainly a shock and surprise. So Uttanapada regretted that he hadn't taken proper care of Dhruva Maharaj and that was the cause of his young son going into the forest. So in this way Tsuruchi must have also been aware of the change in the mentality of Uttanapada. That Uttanapada understood that the, the, the cause of his neglecting Dhruva Maharaj was his over affection for Tsuruchi. So Suruchi understands now that her husband's not so bewildered by her, that he's more cautious in dealing with his wives. So there'll be some change there in Suruchi. And uh, what happens ultimately is, uh, well, she's attached to her own son her own son, Uttama. And when Uttama, the son, the other, her son, he was killed by Yakshas. So at that time, she went into the forest searching for her son. 
She was so attached to her son that she went into the forest searching for him and she died in a forest fire. So in this way she departed from the world. But as far as her destiny goes, I don't know what kind of destiny she would achieve. Yeah, any other question? Yes, Prabhu? Oh, this is a good point. Yes, I'm glad you brought that up, Prabhu. Uh, <laughs> we may think that we should go to demigods for material desires, but that's wrong. We should understand that even we have material desires, we should only go to the Supreme Lord. And this is what we learn from the pastimes of Dhruva Maharaj. This is one of the important points in this Leela of Dhruva Maharaj going to the forest. That he wasn't pure. He did have material desires. But even you have material desires, still you should worship the Supreme Lord. You don't worship other gods. And that is described in Srimad Bhagavatam also. There's a verse there, Akama, Sarva Kamova, Moksha Kama, Udharati, Tivrena, Bhakti Yogena, Yajita, Purushantara. Even one has all material desires or no material desires or desires liberation, in whatever situation one is in, one should still worship the Supreme Lord. And that's why. Dhruva Maharaj was instructed by Narada Muni and by his mother and they were all telling him, worship the Supreme Lord. Nobody, they weren't telling him, worship the demigods. The demigods are, that's for people who are less intelligent. But why, why is, what's the benefit in worshipping the Supreme Lord? Why should you worship? even you have material desires, the point is, by worshipping the Supreme Lord, you will become purified. But you worship the demigods, you won't get purified. <laughs> You're not, you may get your material desire, but you won't get purified. You have one material desire, then you have another material desire. But Dhruva Maharaj, he worshipped the Supreme Lord, he became purified. This is a very important instruction from this pastime. So in all circumstances, even we do have material desires. We wish, you shouldn't think, oh Prabhu, I can't cook, I have too many material desires. <laughs> oh, I can't offer RT, I have too many material desires, I shouldn't go on the altar. No, you should. You do the service, you will become purified. You get rid of the material desires, just go on serving Krishna. That is the great benefit of service to the Supreme Lord. Thank you, Prabhu. Any other question? Okay, thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Very thankful to Maharaj. As Maharaj said, we have heard this pastime so many times, but every time we keep hearing, hearing this, it's so relishable, especially when we hear from the Sadhu. So we thank Maharaj. Maharaj continued tomorrow evening also, same time. And on Sunday morning also, Maharaj will give us uh, the Bhagavatam class. So we're really looking forward to Maharaj's association. And we also want to thank all the devotees. Uh, it's not easy in Singapore when the working day to assemble. Uh, these many devotees have come, so we really thank you all the devotees. And, uh, Let me present myself downstairs.